Uh, OK, then. Well, it's 75 years since the skies above Britain were alive with the roar of spitfires and hurricanes defending our shores against the Nazi Luftwaffe. Now, as the years pass and the memories fade, the RAF is looking for new ways to honour the sacrifice its pilots made that summer. And the RAF would like you to help them. Now, we're going to tell you how after Dan's brought us this remarkable survival story. This memorial in Kent lists every single Allied airman who took part in the Battle of Britain. One out of every six pilots who flew in the battle was killed. And this man here, Keith Lawrence, is one of the heroic survivors of that extraordinary battle in the skies. We were all in our early 20s and we were all wanted a piece of the action. But when your mates start getting killed and wounded, does that not erode your enthusiasm a bit for, for, for getting out there? Uh, no, it didn't. After we stood down at last night, we were straight off to the local pub. And as soon as we got there and the beers were poured, it was a case of, well, pity about poor old so-and-so today. And, and he was forgotten. Those who survived depended on a combination of courage, skill and determination. But they needed at least a small share of good luck as well. Keith used most of his share all in one day on the 27th of November 1940 when he was out on a routine weather observation flight. I saw three aircraft flash by underneath me and I had a height advantage and turned that into a speed advantage to chase after them and make an attack. As he started firing, Keith's Spitfire was hit. The very next thing I knew, I was out of my aircraft. I had been ejected. To understand what had happened to Keith, you need to know a little bit about the Spitfire. Over the top of the pilot's head was the famous, iconic Spitfire bubble canopy, which sealed them in. Now, Keith was hit by an explosion so powerful that his body was blasted upwards out of the seat, through the canopy and out into the open air. That broke his right leg twice, it ripped the calf off his left leg, and it smashed his right arm and shoulder. Keith was in big trouble. By the time I was down to 6,000 feet, I found that there was no no strength in this hand to pull the D-ring for the parachute. And so I scrabbled around with my left hand, eventually got it open, and I found myself in a strong westerly wind drifting out to sea. Keith's troubles were far from over. There was a problem with his life vest, known as the May West. When I'd been ejected, the parachute had split open the buoyancy bag of the May West. So I was taking Wharf on board. Keith stood little chance of surviving in the freezing water for more than a few minutes, but an incredible piece of luck saved him. A great grey shape appeared alongside me, and a big strong arm came from over the side and picked me out. When I was taken in, I suppose my last mouthful very close to The lifeboat crew was only in the area because they were searching for another downed pilot. And they'd only been able to find Keith because he'd accidentally picked up the wrong life jacket that morning. The one he was wearing had little canisters here with fluorescent dye. These would release the dye when they hit the water. Keith's own Mae West didn't have those, so his life was saved by somebody else's life jacket. If that dye pack hadn't been there, I'd have, been a, I'd have been a drowned man, for certain. And Keith's luck didn't end with that unlikely chain of events that saved his life. In the hospital, he met a young nurse, Kay. Four years later, they were married. They recently celebrated 70 years of marriage with their children and grandchildren. What about your, your wife and kids and grandkids? What do they think about that day? <laughs> Well, that's simple enough, isn't it? I suppose if my father hadn't survived the war, we wouldn't be here. 